This time, Sark and this video, we are looking at the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act 1998. So first of all, let's look at what are human rights. As in terms of human rights, they can often be divided into two categories. Now this is civil and political rights and socio-economic rights. Now civil and political rights are regarded as being central to daily human life in a democratic society, whereas socio-economic rights seek to merely enrich the quality of life. Now the main difference between the two categories of rights is the level of protection that they warrant. So civil and political rights, which includes things like the protection of life and the right to vote, are often protected in relevant documents and declarations and can be protected by preventing state institutions from violating the values they uphold. By contrast, socio-economic rights, which include the right to work and leisure, often form positive provisions on the state to offer a good quality of life. So now we'll look at the Council of Europe and the European Convention of Human Rights, or the ECHR. As by 1945, Europe had been at the centre of two world wars in the space of 30 years, and this had led to mass devastation. This meant that significant action was required to ensure that such abuses were not repeated, thus resulting in a number of various international bodies. Now one of the bodies to arise was the Council of Europe, which was formed by the government of 25 states with the broad aim of fostering democratic government within Western Europe. The Council of Europe stated that signatory states must accept the principles of the rule of law and of the enjoyment by all persons within its jurisdiction of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So this meant that they set out a document containing basic rights and fundamental freedoms in the ECHR. Now this was introduced in 1951 and ratified by 10 states in 1953. Now many more have since ratified it. Now the articles of the ECHR set out a number of rights and freedoms. So Article 2 you have right to life. Article 3 is the prohibition of torture. Article 4 is a prohibition of slavery and forced labour. Article 5 is right to liberty and security. Article 6 is the right to a fair trial. Article 7 is no punishment without law. Article 8 is right to respect for private and family life. Article 9 is freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Article 10 is freedom of expression. Article 11 is freedom of assembly and association. Article 12 is right to marry. Article 13 is the right to effective remedy. Article 14 is a prohibition of discrimination. And Article 15 is a derogation in time of emergency, which means that in a time of war or other public emergency, the contracting party may derogate from its obligations under this convention. Now, there are a few other articles, but these are the main ones that we've just talked about. So the rights can be distinguished between three different categories. You have absolute rights, you have limited rights, and you have qualified rights. Now, the difference between each of these relates to the manner in which they are to be protected and to what extent states can derogate from their obligations under these articles. So absolute rights are the most fundamental insofar as they can never be qualified. This means there is never a situation in which they should not be protected or circumstances in which it would be permissible to derogate from them under Article 15. So absolute rights are limited to Article 3, Article 4 and Article 7. Now qualified rights are those that though protected by the ECHR, it is permissible to interfere or derogate rights where competing rights or interests might be protected. So Article 8, 9, 10 and 11 are all examples of qualified rights. For example, Article 8, Subsection 2 states that there shall be no interference by a public authority with the exercise of this right to private and family life, except such as in accordance with the law and is necessary in a democratic society in the interest of national security, public safety or the economic well-being of a country. Similar provisions are also in other qualified rights, and it is also known that rights have to be balanced against each other, like the right to private life under Article 8, and then the freedom of expression under Article 10. Now then, limited rights are in the middle of absolute rights and qualified rights, because they can be restricted in certain lawful circumstances set out in the provision itself. For example, Article 5 sets out certain lawful ways that somebody can be deprived of their liberty. It's also possible to derogate from limited rights, as Article 15 explains. Since the original ECHR rights were set out and ratified, various additions have been made in the form of protocols. Now, with regards to the UK, the only protocols that have been ratified are Protocol 1 in 1954, and then Protocol 6 and 13. So next we're going to look at the European Court of Human Rights, the Plenary Court, and the Committee of Ministers. 
because initially there were three main institutions tasked with enforcing and upholding the ECHR rights in practice. And these were the ECTHR, which is the European Court of Human Rights, the Committee of Ministers, and the European Commission of Human Rights. Now, whilst the first two still survive in a slightly different form, the European Commission of Human Rights was abolished in the late 1990s, and its functions of assessing the admissibility of applications to the court were assumed by the court itself. Now, first of all, we'll look at the European Court of Human Rights. Because at a domestic level, Council of Europe member states have their own individual institutions and facilities through which to enforce and uphold the Convention rights. So at Council level, the European Court of Human Rights serves as, as an international court which rules on individual or state applications which allege violations of civil and political rights. So the Court of Human Rights was set up in 1959 and located in Strasbourg. Now, since 1998, it has acted as a full-time and permanent court. So, Article 19 established the European Court of Human Rights, and Article 20 stated that the court shall consist of a number of judges equal to that of the high contracting parties, which is currently 48. Now, applications to the European Court of Human Rights are brought under Article 33 for states and Article 34 for individuals. Now, this is only done so where all appropriate domestic remedies have been exhausted, and it must be deemed admissible, so it cannot be anonymous, substantially the same as a matter already examined by the court, or if the applicant has not suffered a significant disadvantage. Now, one of the issues that the European Court of Human Rights faces is that they are enforcing ECHR rights across a wide number of countries with very different legal systems and political establishments. So this means that the principle of the margin of appreciation has been developed by the court to temper these differences and to give each state a margin within which the rights can be interpreted. This means that instead of interpreting and enforcing a given ECHR right in strict and liberal terms, the European Court of Human Rights might adopt a broader, more flexible interpretation which is mindful of different constitutional and political facts of a state. For example, in the case of Handyside versus United Kingdom, 1976, the defendant was convicted under the Obscene Publications Act of 1959 and 1964 and applied to the European Court of Human Rights, claiming that his right to free expression was infringed. Now, although the court stated that the freedom of expression may be applicable to things that may be regarded as offensive, they also found no violation of Article 10 due to this margin of appreciation. Next, we'll look at the plenary court, as the plenary court does not fulfil any formal judicial function and is instead tasked with the administrative functions of the court's day-to-day -day business. So the functions include the election of a president and the vice presidents of the court, the establishment of the chambers, adoption of the rules of the court, and election of the registrar and deputy registrars. Next is a committee of ministers. As alongside the European Court of Human Rights, the committee of ministers helps to enforce and implement the ECHR rights. So this is composed of the foreign ministers from each of the council's member states. So the committee of ministers plays an important role in enforcing the judgment of European Court of Human Rights, and it helps with questions of interpretation and dealing with member states that refuse to abide by particular judgments. So now let's look at the human rights protection in the UK pre-1998. Now, although British lawyers played a pivotal role in drafting the ECHR in the 1950s, it was not until 1998 that its rights were incorporated into UK domestic law with the enactment of the Human Rights Act 1998. It was also not until 1966 that the UK government started permitting individuals access to Strasbourg in order to challenge violations of ECHR rights. However, before 1998, rights protection in the UK was more reliant on the common law and the courts. For example, in the case of Derbyshire County Council versus Times Newspapers Limited, 1993, it was held that it was in the public interest to allow a council to be subject to scrutiny and criticism because the threat of a civil action for defamation would have an inhibiting effect on the freedom of speech. And in this case, Lady Butler Sloss held the view that the ECHR should be used as an aid to interpretation. However, there are also pre-1998 cases which dismissed human rights because they were not incorporated into English law. For example, the case of Malone versus Commissioner of Police of the Metropolis, 1979, decided that telephone tapping was not against the law of England. This was because the Convention of Human Rights had the status of a treaty which was not justiciable in England and there was no right to privacy in English law. 
However, the ECTHR decided that the phone tapping was illegal under Article 8 of the ECHR. But then we had the Human Rights Act 1998. Because one of the issues underpinning the government's eventual incorporation of the ECHR into domestic law was the number of occasions that the UK had been taken to Strasbourg for alleged infringement of the convention rights. So this meant that in the White Paper, which was entitled Rights Brought Home, the Human Rights Bill, stated that the time has come to enable people to enforce their convention rights against the state in British courts, rather than having to incur delays and expense which are involved in taking a case to Strasbourg. So this meant the Human Rights Bill was introduced into Parliament in November 1997 and received royal assent on 9th of November 1998. Now it came into force on the 2nd of October 2000. Now the Act simply incorporates the rights set out in the Convention and imposes a duty on public authorities to act in accordance with the ECHR rights. So in order to maintain the sovereignty of Parliament, which we'll talk about in a later video, there is no legal requirement that legislation passed after the coming into force of the Human Rights Act has to be compatible with the ECHR rights. So this means that Parliament is able to legislate in any way that it wishes. This being the case though, Section 19 of the Act does require a Minister introducing any bill into the Houses of Parliament to make a statement which either declares the provisions of the bill compatible with the ECHR rights, or noting that they are incompatible, but that the government wishes to proceed anyway. Now there are also other sections which help to maintain the sovereignty of Parliament, as we will talk about now. So first of all, there is Section 2. Now Section 2 of the Act is intended to make clear the relationship between the UK courts and the European Court of Human Rights. It states that UK judges must take into account judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, but are not bound to follow their decisions and judgments. However, Section 6 provides that it is unlawful for a public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with a convention right. And Section 6, subsection 3, says that a public authority includes a court or tribunal. So this means that although Section 2 of the 1998 Act permits a broad margin in which Strasbourg jurisprudence can be applied or disapplied in the UK courts, the duty imposed on the courts consequently results in favour of following the decisions of Strasbourg. Now, the leading case on following the Strasbourg judgments is Ulla versus Special Adjudicator in 2004, which considered an appeal against a refusal from asylum. Now, in this case, Lord Bingham stated that whilst the case law of Strasbourg is not strictly binding, courts should, in absence of any special circumstances, follow any clear and constant jurisprudence of the Strasbourg court. Now, the duty of national courts is to keep pace with the Strasbourg jurisprudence as it evolved over time. No more, but certainly no less. Now, this is known as the mirror principle. However, there have also been cases where the UK have rejected the judgment of Strasbourg and the European Court of Human Rights. In the case of Hearst versus United Kingdom 2005, the European Court of Human Rights claimed that it was a disproportionate breach of the ECHR Protocol 1 Article 3 for the UK to deny all convicted prisoners the right to vote under Section 3 of the Representation of the People Act 1983. However, Parliament refused to introduce legislation that would give prisoners the right to vote in spite of a ruling. Eventually, in 2017 though, the UK government did announce a slight compromise which allowed a very limited number of prisoners to vote. This did satisfy the European Court of Human Rights. Next is Section 3, because Section 3 of the Human Rights Act 1998 states that so far as it possible to do so, primary and subordinate legislation must be read and given effect in a way which is compatible with a convention rights. So this essentially means that the court must attempt to achieve a convention compliant reading, even if that means altering the wording of an otherwise clear and unambiguous provision. However, as confirmed in Bellinger v. Bellinger 2003, the courts cannot depart significantly from the original meaning of a statute, and if this is needed, a declaration of incompatibility under Section 4 is the appropriate response instead. And Section 4, subsection 2 of the Human Rights Act empowers the courts to make declarations of incompatibility. Now, the process to which incompatibilities are dealt with are then set out in Section 10 of the Act. Now, this empowers ministers to make amendments to the legislation as he considers necessary to remove the incompatibility. Now, Section 4 is drafted in a way that clearly maintains the sovereignty of Parliament. So firstly, the provision falls short of affording the court's power to set aside primary legislation where they establish an incompatibility. 
Instead, it serves to make Parliament merely aware that a particular statute or sections of that statute are incompatible. It is then up to Parliament to rectify the incompatibility, yet there is still no legal obligation upon them to do so. Secondly, Section 4 does not require the courts to make declarations of incompatibility, merely offers the option to do so. This means that the sovereignty of Parliament is maintained because the courts cannot strike down legislation. Now, despite a lack of a legal obligation, the courts usually do make a de declaration of incompatibility when one arises, and it's rare for Parliament not to address this under their Section 10 powers. In fact, as of July 2016, 34 declarations of incompatibility have been made by UK courts. However, Section 4 has been seen as a last resort if the situation cannot be rectified under Section 3. And the Lord Chancellor has suggested that in 99% of the cases that arise, there will be no need for judicial declaration of incompatibility. Now, Sections 6 and 7 of the Act set out and clarify the procedure and basis on which applications can be brought before the courts, challenging alleged breaches of ECHR rights. Now, Section 6 states that it is unlawful for a public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with a convention right. Section 6 of Section 3 then states that a public authority includes a court or tribunal or any person whose function are of a public nature. Now, issues which arise from this are what constitutes a public authority and whether ECHR rights can be applied horizontally. Now, Section 7 states that a person who claims that a public authority has acted or proposes to act in a way made unlawful by Section 6 may bring proceedings against the authority under this Act in the appropriate court or tribunal or rely on the convention right or rights concerned in any legal proceedings. Now, they must have been a victim of the unlawful act, though. Now, where an application under Section 7 is successful, then the court has the power under Section 8 subsection 1 to grant such a relief or remedy or make such an order within its powers as it considers just or appropriate. A court can also award damages where it has the power. So finally, we'll just look at the future of human rights in the UK and the potential for a British Bill of Rights. Now, the Human Rights Act 1998 has received its fair share of criticism since its enactment, including the concern that the ECHR and the European Court of Human Rights undermines both the role of the UK courts and the sovereignty of Parliament. Now, there is also a mounting concern that Strasbourg have attempted to overrule decisions of Parliament and overturn the UK court's careful application of the rights, now prisoner voting, and the rights of foreign nationals convicted of terrorist offences are just two examples. Now, as such, there have been plans under Conservative government to repeal the Human Rights Act and replace it with a British Bill of Rights. Now, although there are no formal plans for such a move, the reforms may include a limitation of the UK's court's ability to effectively rewrite legislation through their interpretive duty, with plans to ensure that the UK courts will interpret legislation based upon its normal meaning and the clear intention of Parliament, and a break in the formal link between British courts and the European Courts of Human Rights. Now, this would permit UK courts in having the final say in interpreting convention rights. It is also worth mentioning that once Britain have left the EU, this will not impact their membership of the Council of Europe because they are two different things. For one, EU law is binding upon its member states, whereas the ECHR is not binding. So thank you for watching this video and see you soon. Bye.